Hello, and welcome to this ARM Dev Summit session around the Intelligent Edge, which combines compute resources, artificial intelligence, and software edge infrastructure from partners like Ampere Computing, NVIDIA, and SUSE. My name is Brian Gardner. I'm a senior technology strategist at SUSE, so let's get going. Here is a quick outline of what is going to be covered in the session today. First, a background of why these partners have worked together in the past and now are working together on this topic with the goals for this. A quick summary overview of edge computing today, and then the core technologies being detailed of how to make this even more productive and performant to create and use workloads or applications that enable the edge computing, the intelligent edge, Finally, uh, some lessons we've learned doing this, observations we've found, and some potential future steps. This project, labeled Hammerhead, like a species of shark, is a collaboration between multiple partners, including SUSE, Ampere Computing, NVIDIA, and the ARM community, around generating reference designs, showcasing the enterprise grade use cases with ARM64. For instance, SUSE is a provider of open source software defining infrastructure components like operating system, Kubernetes, and system management, and works with the ARM community to make sure that those all run on that platform. Then there's Ampere Computing that creates very performant versions of those ARM64 processors and incorporates them into systems with high performance, better efficiency, and lower cost of ownership. Then there's NVIDIA who works on the internet, Ethernet connectivity to make that solution stack even more productive. For instance, a couple of years ago, we worked together to demonstrate a high-performance Ceph-based storage cluster, where the performance was better than the competitive architecture, the power usage was much lower, and the pricing of the cluster was much lower. So the goals for this time were to do something similar in the intelligent ed space to demonstrate how all these components could enable enterprises to do intelligent edge computing. Okay, with this section, let's start talking about edge computing. And we're gonna to start today with that multi-definition depending on who you're talking to, but also cover ecosystem and how you can move towards using resources like this for intelligence and edge. This is a simplistic overview of an edge ecosystem. Let's start on the right hand side here with the core and that could be the classic data center or it could be in the cloud depending on the organization or enterprise whether they have cloud and or data center or the hybrid view of that. But once you start going into the distributed computing model of edge you might move some things to what we call a near edge which could be a small finite cluster it could be, for instance, in like the back room in the hospital. It could be at the bottom of a cell tower. It could be in a factory. And as you go farther away, you might have more singular devices at that far edge where you do edge computing that's closer to those sensors or Internet of Things. And as you notice on the bottom squiggly line there, that's actually the data pipeline. The data comes in from sensors or Internet of Things to the far edge and you want to analyze and do the analytics of the data there as much as you can and filter and pass it on to like the near edge and even the core cloud or completely just pass it all. And with the purple line at the top, that's the workflows and models that are passed between these various categories too. So you could be doing training in the core or the cloud and then propagate that to the near edge or to that far edge device. And that far edge device could be something that's hanging in a semi truck. It could be something that's attached to a medical imaging device. But you can see how this edge ecosystem covers a lot of distributed locales, but yet you still need to do a lot of the computing similarly across all these. When further refining that edge ecosystem and trying to get things to work better for business reasons and whatnot, you might go to the intelligent edge, okay? And really what that means is making sure that you have all the computational resources, the network resources, and the actual intelligence to handle that data that you got 
to give you the analytics and the intelligence and the things that you need out of it to make your business go better without having to move that data so far to one of the other categories, but do it as close as possible, right? To, to minimize that latency, to get the benefit of that data analysis and make smarter decisions. So some of the major elements of this, of course, are the connectivity, right? Not only to the sensors or whatnot, where you got the data from, but how you move things around both ways, like I talked about on the data pipeline and the workflow. Then there's the secure device management to make sure, of course, that thing that's way out there is secure and managed well. Then, of course, that data pipeline that we talked about, of moving the data where we need to, filtering as possible, and or passing what we need to, whether it's just an exception or not. And then being able to migrate those workloads from wherever they were built to wherever they're needed to run, like the intelligent edge. As I've hinted in previous slides around the edge ecosystem, there are lots of verticals and industries and whatnot in each one of these spaces that can leverage this. So for instance, in the near edge, like I mentioned, you can do things in the telco space or media, and you want to focus on that connectivity, and they may just use CSPs and whatnot, but at that edge, they need to be able to respond to consumers in a way that's very productive low latency and multi-tenant and overwhelming usage of it, okay? And then the far edge, there's lots of industrial, commercial, and public sectors that do this. Like I mentioned, with manufacturing factory, right? Or that semi-truck. Or it could be oil and gas to do the seismic things to figure out, you know, where that resource is so they do the drilling. In the commercial space, like I mentioned, it could be in a retail and a store. Um, it could be that medical imaging device for healthcare. It could be branch offices, uh, stores, or whatever that you might need to do things for that local group. And then, of course, in the public sector, there may be some security things that come into place to make sure that that data is secure and maintained and all that across all of those different kinds of sectors. And if you look at the stack, it's very similar that there's hardware stacks, there's software stacks. And then there's integrations above that to make this possible for those workloads in these verticals to be productive. Okay, hope you're ready now. We're going to talk about how to enable that edge ecosystem using layered sets of core technologies. And this is the fun part for technologists like me to talk about each one of these layers and how to do it. In the core technology space, let's start at the bottom looking at that diagram on the right there about the physical resources that you need to create the stack that is useful for something like an intelligent edge. Um, first, Ampere Computing provides Ultra, which is the CPU, which is up to 80 cores of 64-bit ARM version 8.2. It has the ability to integrate with very performant memory and with a good capacity of memory that you can do. And they provide it in a classic enterprise grade server class with reliability, availability, serviceability, for giving you the capacity to do that compute that you need and reveal these data insights and do those analytics at the edge, or you can do it in the core in the cloud too. Next up is the networking aspect, and this is from NVIDIA. They have the NICs that can go in those Ampere computing servers that can go up to 200 gigabytes per second. Gigabytes per second. It was Connect X86 run in the PCI lens. They uh, enable in encryption. And what you'll see later on is once you have something like this, you can have lots of clients pounding on your system and still very responsive. They also provide things like the Spectrum switch, which is um, can deal with the 200 gigabit per second mix and whatnot. It's 1U, it's very small form factor, so it fits very nicely even in that near edge space. Of course, it fits in the core and the cloud too. Um, but you can see how now we've talked about the physical resources of the CPU and the systems and the networking.
let's go on to the next layer. In this layer, which is typically operating system based, it is a function of making sure that it can work with those physical resources below, but also dealing with the workloads that are going to run above it, whether that's from a package standpoint, or whether it's a VM and relying on a hypervisor or containerized. And in this context, there are three operating systems that you could choose from. First one is SUSE Linux Enterprise Micro, which is very focused on Edge. Okay, and it, it does provide all capabilities to run any of those workouts that I mentioned. There's automation to make it easy to do deployment. It inherits the security certifications and things I'll talk about next. But one of the key things is it's a very immutable root kind of read-only file system with things like SE Linux. So you can make it very secured and also be able to do transactional updates and roll back to the last known good states. Furthermore, there's a, a web interface for via cockpit that you can actually launch those workloads if you needed to. Then there's SUSE Linux Enterprise Server, which is more of a general purpose operating system. So the former could be if you really just want to use it the edge and or the core cloud. And this one is the same thing. You can do it on the edge of the core cloud. And it supports all those same workloads. And the, it, it is what that compliance and security certifications happen on, whether it's common criteria, FIPS, STIG, the SCAP, um, CIS. And you have an administration interface to be able to manage the system as well. And then, if you wanted to, you could go down the path of using a community distribution from OpenSUSE. And if you use the Leap one, the core binaries are compatible with SLES, and it's upgradable with SLES. So you could start off with the community version, and then when you need support, upgrade it to that, and the workloads and everybody would still be happy, and you got the support out of that. In the context of workload infrastructure, what we're starting to see, because a lot of this is greenfield, it's not something you've done before and whatnot, organizations are going down the path of doing cloud-native workloads, okay? So they're focusing on container and they want orchestrated workloads. In that space, there are offerings from SUSE called K3S and RKE. They're very extensible and Literally, to deploy either one of those, it's like a single command to do that, okay? And they are CNCF certified. And what you get is the orchestration of the workloads, potentially through APIs and whatnot. Furthermore, if you do need that data pipeline, which you're going to need at the Intelligent Edge, there is another offering called Longhorn, which provides persistent storage to have stateful containers running over and over and managing data. But once you have these pieces, these three pieces in there, you can leverage rule-based access control to control who can do what, where, and when, and then having multiple namespaces so that you can have, you know, a security group that does something on one namespace and your analytics that does it in another end namespace so that there's a core isolation as needed. And this is how you head towards the intelligent edge. And you'll notice that one footnote there from a couple of years ago where they talked about more than 50% of the workloads are going to be cloud native. And the newest version that just came out a little bit ago is saying more like 75% will be cloud native. As in the previous scaling where you talked about multiple workloads that need to be orchestrated. Now, if you're talking about all of that distributing computing across or cloud, near edge, far edge, and even tiny edge devices, you need a multi-cluster management tool. And that is Rancher, SUSE Rancher. It provides those consistent cluster operations, whether it's deploying it, whether it's managing the workloads, whether it's doing like a GitOps thing to make sure that I'm going to update my workload and propagate it across everywhere it needs to go. You also gain the security and the compliance so that you can have centralized control over policies and auditing. <clears throat> and in addition, you get single sign-on things so that you can go to that web interface or the API or the CLI for it and manage all of those things everywhere in that environment. And it's just even further around that role-based access control, how you can tie it into another uh, 
authentication thing so that you can do that namespace and multi-tenancy. Multi okay, now that we have... Once you have that infrastructure set up, like the Intelligent Edge, Near Edge, Far Edge, or the Core in the Cloud, once you have that set up and you've gone down the path of doing cloud-native computing, here's an example that we've learned by doing this across multiple workloads and whatnot. Basically, you have to pick the use case of what you want to do, what you need out of this. Go find and or search for a workload app, and then start doing some checks. Is it ARM64 compatible? If so, you can move on to the next step. And if not, what you do is you go build the binary that is compatible then, or those executables. You create container images, then you wrap it into like a Kubernetes manifest for simplistic deployment, or create a Helm chart if you have a multiple services that need to be running for this, or an operator. Once you have those in place, you can move on to see if the resources are ready to do what you need to do. And what you do is you kind of test the availability as a does it spin up? Does it run? Does it do everything okay? And then do the performance check to make sure that you're getting it out. And then you may have to iterate to make it with tuning and whatnot, or do things like replica sets, saying I want three of these running all the time, and let Kubernetes handle that for you. Once you do that, you, you can deploy this, and you can iterate through this, and you can revise it. And you know, as you do analytics and things at the intelligent edge, you may realize over time, oh, I can get a better answer if I do this. So you iterate and you redo it, you redo the deployment. And it literally is like you did the infrastructure core technologies layers. It's kind of like one command to make that so. Here is one example of an application or a workload that you could run on these clusters or individual nodes. So imagine that you have a proxy load balancer in front of it so that you could have multiple things behind it and you have the resiliency and availability that way. Then you could have something like Express.js or Node.js that is the web service that's running, but what it relies on is a cached set of data from something like Redis and it has a persistent backstore through MongoDB. So you have a multi-tiered thing. And again, this could be one command, one push, one click to deploy this on a cluster or on an individual node with cloud native, with Kubernetes, with things like Rancher. So here's what it looks like on the cluster. Here's the Longhorn backend as the persistent storage. And you can do testing to make sure that the latency is good. Then you can create a manifest for Mongo to deploy it. Same thing for Redis. Then you can create your web service on GitHub, create a container, launch it, launch the ingress controller, and then do performance testing to see what it looks like. And then you can also look at the cluster and see its performance. Okay, let's drill into that Locust tool to measure the performance metrics of that web service. Here, for an example, we set up emulated a thousand users and pounded on the web service. And then we decided, okay, let's bump that up to 10,000 and measure that response time. And you can see the number there. And then we went, okay, let's do 20,000. And then we'll measure the response time. And you can see it went up slightly, but you can see that it seems like it's going okay. So we went up even higher, shoot it for 50,000 and looked at the number of requests per second that we're going through. And then we decided, okay, let's make the request numbers go even higher. But even when we bumped it up to 100,000, which was a lot of effort, if you look on the back end of the services, you'll find that basically this service is just kind of twiddling its thumbs, even though it's being pounded on. It's not using a lot of resources. And back to that request 2,500 per request with 100,000 emulated users, what we found is we, we're going to have to spend more time creating the load generators to really beat on the system to stress it out beyond what it's capable of doing. As a second example of an application workload, Ampere Computing had a recent acquisition of Monspecta, and they have AI machine learning kinds of tools and abilities to do this. 
so we could run machine learning per testing scenarios. And as you can see in the stack, even though we're focused on the CPU aspect, not the GPU for right now, or the FPGA or the AI chip, you have multiple layers and multiple tools like TensorFlow or PyTorch or Onyx, whatever, that you can run within this context on this infrastructure. Whether it's that single edge node, far edge node, whether it's that cluster at the near edge or core and cloud where you do the training. So here you see that it's running on a multi-node cluster. And what we did is build a container image, built a manifest to deploy it, and then ran four different test cases, each with four variants underneath it, to generate the output of what the performance was for something like this. And ta-da, here's some of the performance that we've seen doing this. Uh, as you'll notice, there is the yellow bar that was the competitive architecture. And that was run as a package on bare metal. But in our environments, on K3S on a single node, or it could be multiple nodes in an RKA cluster, it could be single or multiple nodes too, again, we ran the comparison and we were doing something like ResNet 50, which is image categorization. And the goal is the lower the latency, the better. And you can see in each one of those four variants, server, offline, multi-stream, and single stream, you can see the potential performance improvement from 2.3 to 3.4 times faster on this environment with that Ampere computing node, with that NVIDIA networking, with K3S, RKE, and Rancher managing it. So that thing that we did last time, I've showed you how we built a container manifest, deployed it, ran the test. Here's the output that we see. And on the other test cases, we saw either parity or as high as this one. This was actually the best response. And this one was the most optimized, where the other ones have not been optimized, but they're already on parity. So we know that we can make them go even faster. So to start to wrap up, Here's some of the observations and things we learned doing this. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but on some of those browsers that were in the animated GIFs on the previous slides, there were so many tabs open because you could go find so many different possible workloads to dry and dress whatever use case you wanted to do. So for your intelligent edge, what do you need to do? Go find that one and then go through that process flow like I talked about building the container manifest and even with that default configuration stack set up, we've seen over and over again, the performance values of this combination are either equivalent or often well beyond the competitive architectures. Plus you also gain the benefit of lower power consumption and lower system cost and lower stack cost. One of the things that we did learn though, was that so many of those searchable workloads are not directly usable on ARM64 platforms. So you really do need to follow that process flowchart to because they had architecture specific assumptions, but by dissecting layer by layer by layer, you could drill down to the point of, okay, I need to do build that binary for ARM64. Now I need to build that container image. I need to put it into a registry. I need to have that manifest pull from that registry or the Helm chart. And you can build that over and over again. So going forward, and as mentioned up front with that collaboration of the partners that we are part of, we want to continue testing new things and finding other use cases, other workloads. But <clears throat> you can see how it's already enterprise grade ready. It's already performant. And it's already compatible with a lot of things out there, even though you might have to do a breakdown and and do some steps manually and whatnot. So what we would really like is some user feedback. And I'm going to volunteer and say, if you think this is interesting and you would like to try it, reach out to us because we could potentially give you access to this test environment and let you try some of these things to test your workloads and configurations. For further related content, all of these line items that are underlined, those are all links to get you to more detailed information. And I would encourage you, if you can, to grab the slides <clears throat> because any of the underlying things in the slides also are links to more and more details.
But if you want thing to know more about the Ampere computing and the Ultra processor, you can go to that link. If you want to go to find out more about the NVIDIA networking piece, if you want to find out more about Linux operating systems or the Kubernetes K3S RKE Rancher, you can go to those links. So with that, thank you very much for attending this. I hope you learned even a fraction of what I learned when we did this. And I hope you understand the benefits and the value of what you could do in this space now to make your business even better, more productive and whatnot. And using that intelligent edge to do things better, faster, and even with lower total cost of ownership. So again, thank you. Have a great rest of your day.